They would have parties and everyone was invited except me and someone else. So this terrifying thought came and I thought, oh my gosh, for a fleeting moment, I thought if I become like them, then they'll stop rejecting me every day and I'd be happy. And it was that terrifying moment that inspired me to quit my job the next day. Because I realized I don't want to become like these people. I know they're good people, but I knew intuitively that they had once been like me. And that they had once felt the same pain I felt. And that because of it, they had conformed. They'd lost sight of their true selves. And lost sight of what I'd call their soul. Their true nature the essence of who they are, their freedom, their joy. So, that's a happy ending. But it's not the whole story, because when I quit that job, I drove back from the Midwest all the way to California, and I wanted to understand why these people could be so happy making others unhappy. So I went to graduate school to find out. So. In those studies, I found with not at all my prediction that the people who uh, were stealing or cheating tended to have a belief that was cynical about humanity. They, we found an unpredicted correlation between the degree to which people endorsed statements about the untrustworthiness of other humans and the degree and whether or not they would steal coins or cheat on a test. So then I started thinking, oh, so our beliefs predict our behaviors, which you already know, but I had to figure out as a scientist. And in my research, I found that the people who stole coins had significantly uh, more reports of friends who would steal. So it led me to think it's reference group based. So in the reference group, we're going to define it in a second, but it's the, your, the social group whose standards you use as your own. So when you're a kid, it could be your family. Then you go to college, it could be your friends. Could, and then you go to work, it could be your workmates. Or maybe not. Maybe it's a rabbit. <laughs> maybe it's your hamster. But, or maybe it's the woods. And we'll talk about that today. Making your, the non-social your reference group is what I c call spirituality. It's a whole different way of looking at it. So, um, that was the research I did. Those were the results I found. And then I used a thread of logic to sew together the patches of research in my field into an overarching tapestry of understanding that blew my mind away because it mirrored the tenets of spiritual truth. And I'll be talking about that today, too. And that's where we use logic to get to spirit. So I wanted to know why some people can be happy making us unhappy. And to make a long story short, I discovered a three-step process called the identity shift effect. That's what I call it. And this is what I believe now was going on in that company. So when a person is in a social context where the people are asking that person, ourselves, let's say, to act in a way where we betray the truth of who we are or act in a way that betrays our conscience, betrays our heart, we experience what I call external conflict the threat of social rejection, which is what I was feeling, right, at that company. And that is such a painful emotion that many of us will conform to the group as a way to eradicate or end that feeling. But as soon as that happens, you enter step two of the process, which is you exchange the external conflict for internal conflict, or what we might call self-rejection or guilt because we've now violated our own standards of what is good, right, and true. And that is excruciatingly painful. And so to 
rid ourselves of that feeling, we go through step three of the three-step process, which is what I call an identity shift, where we adopt the toxic group standards as our own self-standards so that no longer do we feel guilt because now we're measuring up to our lower standards and we no longer feel humiliation or social rejection because we're now being accepted for meeting those standards. And now we have no longer internal conflict, no longer do we have external conflict, and the sky is the limit with the evil or the, you know, harm we can do to other human beings, okay? Depression can be socially caused, and this is a hypothesis. I have not proven this, but I have lived it. So it's the truth of my experience, and it matches up to the research that I sewed together using the thread of logic. And if you know someone who's depressed, it might be helpful for them to hear of this idea too, okay? So we've talked about these two groups, the reference group and the everyday group. The everyday group is the group in whose context you generally find yourself. The reference group is the group whose standards you use as your own. Sometimes those two groups are the same group and sometimes they're different. Now imagine you are in a social setting, an everyday group setting, where you're rejected as you are. Imagine you're an amputee. You have no arm. And everyone in your social setting has arms and values people having arms and devalues people without an arm. And it's a, it's a stigma that you can't even change, that you can't get, grow your arm back. So you're trapped in this setting. And since they are your social group, your everyday group, and they're rejecting you, I predict, this is part of my prediction, that over time, if you're trapped in a social world that rejects you as you are, you will come to reject yourself as you are because you're internalizing those social standards because you have no other reference point. So if you're trapped in a social setting that rejects you as you are and you don't have, you know, nature as your reference group as an alternative, that's the only reality you'll know, so you'll come to reject yourself. And there are parallels between rejecting yourself and having the social world reject you. If they're both rejecting you, I call that shame. If they reject you, but you're accepting yourself, I call it humiliation, that's the feeling. And if you're rejecting yourself, but your social group accepts you, then that's guilt. But here you're feeling shame, chronic shame, because you're rejecting yourself and they reject you. So I predict that chronic shame over time is what leads to depression, because it's, it's insidious. It's, anyway. So that's one way, and there are probably many other ways that people are depressed or get depressed. But that's one way I wanted to share with you. And my experience was I lived this experience. Hello, beautiful world. This is Wendy Trainer and her puppy, Skylark. And we're here today to share some amazing news and to send love and joy your way. After 10 years of working on a book, actually nine, uh, since 2005, Yours truly has finished it, and it's a book I wrote for you. It's called The Gift of Cancer, Turn Your Tragedy into a Treasure, a Treasure Map to Happiness. And a big part of it has been proven to increase mood. And moreover, the story, when I've shared it, most of my story, it's uh, been proven in my talks to lead to increased love of life. So if this book is helping others feel the love and joy they are, just imagine what it can do for you.